Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. I'm your host, Elizabeth Bachman, and this is the podcast where we interview experts about leadership, visibility, and using your presentation skills to move your listeners to take action. Before we begin, I want to remind you that if you're curious about your presentation skills and how you're doing, you can take our free four-minute assessment at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's www.speakforresultsquiz.com. And you can see where you are strong in your presentation skills and where maybe you might like a little bit of support. Today, I am so honored to have the amazing, wonderful, spectacular Mitzi Perdue. Mitzi, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, what a complete joy to be here because you know what? I am I'm a supporter and an advocate of, of what you do, probably more than you might even guess, because I feel that how about most of the good things that have happened to me in life have come through speaking. Well, and you are certainly a very experienced public speaker, and I'm going to be asking you about that for sure. Um, let me read your your bio, which is incredibly impressive, so people have an idea of why I'm interviewing you. Mitzi Purdue is an author, speaker, and businesswoman who holds a BA with honors from Harvard and an MPA from the George Washington University. She's a past president of the 40,000 member American Agri-Women, that's agricultural. She's also a former syndicated columnist for Scripps Howard and her column, The Environmental and The Environment and You, was the most widely syndicated environmental column in the country. Her television series, Country Magazine, was syndicated to 76 stations. She's the founder of Series Farms, the second generation family owned commercial and agricultural real estate investment company that has owned rice fields, commercial and residential real estate, and today the family vineyards sell wine grapes to wineries such as Mondav Mondavi, Vogel, Folie a Deux, and Toasted Head. So Mitzi, I'm gonna be over for dinner at your house any minute now. <laughs> Super. <laughs> okay. Mitzi combines the experiences of three longtime family businesses. Her father, Ernest Henderson, co-founded the Sheraton Hotel change, her chain, and her late husband, Frank Perdue, was the second generation in the poultry company that today operates in more than 50 countries. She herself founded Series Farms in 1974. And I love it, Series, after C-E-R-E-S, the Roman name for the goddess of the harvest. I love that. <laughs> not that's an accident. A, uh, not an accident. No, I, I imagine none of that's an accident with you. <laughs> She's also loves to point out that the Henderson family business began in 1840 with the Henderson Estate Company, and they've been having yearly family reunions since 1890. If you've been having yearly family reunions since, uh, uh, if you combine the 180 years since it began and the 100 years that Purdue Farms has been in business and the 46 years since the founding of Ceres Farms, she represents more than three centuries of family business history. You look pretty good for 300, Mitzi. <laughs> Recently, she, honored, she authored How to Make Your Family Business Last, Techniques, Advice, Checklists, and Resources for Keeping Family Businesses in the Family. She has also just recently authored a book with Mark Victor Hansen 
on how to stay up in down times. So Mitzi, uh, we spent all our time reading your bio. It's so impressive. I'm so honored to have you here. Thank you. Well, I'm so honored to be here. I, I just love your premise and I'm getting to love you. So there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, before we get into all the really amazing information that you have to share with us, I ask all my guests about a dream interview. If you could interview somebody from history or someone who's no longer around, let's say, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be listening? Okay, I would, I would immediately answer Mother Teresa. Mm, okay. Because here's a woman who, yeah, with a vow of poverty, with a vow of humility, she owned three saris and the sandals on her feet. That was the beginning and end of her worldly possessions. Yet she did so much to change the world. I'd love to ask her, you know, what gave you the energy? What do you think every day? Uh, you know, just how did you do it? And as for who should listen, I think I'd maybe slightly aim it towards women, mm -hmm. but I'd love it if men listened in. Okay, great. Well, we do a lot in this podcast about helping women navigate our world. And I often think about Mother Teresa oh. and the courage it must have taken because she came from a background of women should not speak up. And by golly, she did. So good for her. Well, actually, I love her story because I don't know if it's widely known, but this woman who, who influenced the whole world, she had such, such an interesting story because although she came from a somewhat, at least middle class background with her vow of poverty, uh, she was eating the bread of the poor and had almost no possessions. But she wanted to help the lepers in Calcutta. And at that time, with this vow of, of obedience, she was assigned to uh, a convent where her whole job was teaching the, the children of the wealthy. She wanted to do more than that. And she spent years trying to persuade the higher ups in her order, now please let me do this. And they all told her, every one of them, no, you can't, you can't make any difference. There are hundreds of thousands of lepers who are dying and you can't make a difference. And her answer was something that guides my life. Her answer was, it's immoral to be discouraged by the size of a problem. The good that we can do, we must do. I love that. The good I that we can that. do, we must do. So The good that we can do, we must do. And it, that it's immoral to be discouraged by the size of the problem. Nowadays, that's, uh, that, thank you for reminding me of that. I read that years ago and I had forgotten it until now. And when I look at the problems facing us nowadays, I, that's, that's a good thing to be reminded of. Thank you. Well, because otherwise it's just too easy to th throw your hands up in the air and say, I give up. But yes. how about that tomorrow? No, we've, the good that we can do, we must do. Yeah. So I definitely want to ask you about ways that women can move forward and ways that women can be, not be daunted by the size of the problem. But to start out, uh, I want to hear a little bit more about you being a pioneer as a woman in the workforce in the early 60s. So you were part of the Sheraton, you know, the family business of Sheraton and then the family business, married into a family business of Purdue. Tell us a little bit more about what you did and what your part was. And, and you were the only woman, right? Well, I, I was a little bit of a pioneer because I, I deliberately chose fields that, that weren't popular with women. And as an example, in college, I'd take economics classes and there would be 200 men and me. Mm. And I felt a certain responsibility. In fact, my whole career, I wanted to do such a good job and be such a team member that, yeah, that they'd want the next woman. Mm -hmm. And so other parts of my career, I became a management intern in Washington. It's a two-year program. There were 21 guys and me. And again, I had the same attitude that I wanted to 
make life easier for the woman who came after me. And one of the ways of doing that was making men want to value what we as women can contribute. And it was very satisfying. Other, other jobs that I had, I became a rice farmer. And I'll repeat that because every time I say it, people don't hear me right, but rice as what you'd eat with chopsticks if you were in Asia. So rice farmer. Why? And why? Uh, because my father died at age 70, unexpectedly. I was at that time 27 years old. And suddenly, since you know, he hadn't expected to die at 70, we thought he'd live you know, another 20 years. I suddenly came into a great big, huge inheritance. He owned 400 hotels in addition to like other business ventures. And so suddenly I have an inheritance. And we had been brought up that we're stewards, that there's, uh, you know, in our family, it was very much looked down on if you were to spend it on like yachts and racehorses. Mm -hmm. uh, so since my job was to hand it on to those who came after me in as good a shape or better as I inherited it, it occurred to me, I was living in California at the time, that investing in agricultural land would be a way of practicing stewardship because there's so many things that you can do if, if you're environmentally minded to make your land available, say for research at the local University of California at Davis, which specializes in, in agriculture. So I spent four years taking courses in agronomy, rural appraisal, agricultural accounting, international agricultural uh, economics. I mean, mm -hmm. I just, four years. And uh, I spent a lot of time studying rural appraisal. So by the time I bought the first property, I had four years of study under my belt, plus four years of socializing with every farmer who would allow me to get near him or her. Mm -hmm. And so when I got into rice farming, there were 5,000 rice growers in California. There were roughly three of which I was one who were actively involved in managing a rice farm. So that was, I mean, 5,000 to three. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I can call myself a pioneer in that. And then I loved talking about it. And I got a job as a farm broadcaster at the local CBS affiliate. And there were 750 farm broadcasters nationally in the Farm Broadcasters Association. And again, um, I think there were maybe, I've, I've lost track of the numbers, but maybe there were five females. Mm -hmm. But I loved it. I, I felt, you know, that there's, obvious disadvantages to being a woman in a non-traditional field. But the other thing is there was a heck of a lot of visibility. If I did anything good, it got noticed. What if you did something that was not so good? Embarrassment, misery, shame, crawl under the pillow, never take it off my head. Uh, yeah, so it's yeah, not a bed of roses, but on balance, I wouldn't have it any other way. How did you pick yourself back up then? Especially, because one of the things that I find nowadays, still nowadays, for, in, in, with all the work that we've done about parity, gender parity, the consequences for women are perceived by women to be much, the consequences of failure seem to be much more dire for women than they are for men. And I don't know if that's an internal perception or a social perception or just, you know, well, you can't have a woman doing that. So one woman made a mistake, so you, no woman can do it. Okay, now gender parity is a passionate interest of mine, but I'll, I'll back up and how did I pick myself back up? It has to do with an internal image I have of myself. And I'll confess it, I'm not sure I've ever said this publicly, but my image of myself is I'm a steamroller. There's an obstacle. It's the equivalent of imagine asphalt and imagine a great big steamroller mm -hmm. and imagine a mosquito stuck in the asphalt. Mm -hmm. The problem is the mosquito and I'm a steamroller and I'm going to overcome it. And you know, people, maybe I get fired from a job, which has happened. Maybe, uh, maybe harassment. Yeah. There's a, uh, thousand nasty things that can happen. But if you're a steamroller, you keep going. I love that. 
I love that. <laughs> That's and I great. think it surprises people because uh, I don't go out of my way to let people know that I'm a steamroller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's disarming, but nevertheless. You were so sweet and friendly. And then <laughs> such a sweet and friendly steamroller. Funny about that. Well, I, uh, I, had, I had something that I, I wrestled with ever since it happened. But I was on the board of uh, KVIE, the local Sacramento public television station. And this board, there's probably, I've lost track of numbers, but let's say three women, 12 guys. Mm -hmm. And at the end of one of the evenings, or one of the board meetings, a guy came up to me and he said, you know, Mitzi, you're the most aggressive, not woman, the most aggressive person I've ever met. And I'm kind of shocked because I try to hide my aggressiveness. And I said, what do you mean? You know, acting all innocent and unsteamrollership. Oh, oh, yes. Said, me, little me. And he said, yeah, because you simply get your way. And, mm -hmm. you know, a good bit of the time people don't know what you're doing, but you get your way. Mm -hmm. Well, so that actually takes me to what advice do you have now about women who are working towards, uh, working towards visibility and leadership in today's world. You know, well, we're I not have, the only ones anymore, but still there are a lot of hoops to jump through. All right, I've always felt just from the beginning of my career and so that nobody has to do any math calculations, I'll just tell you I'm 79 and proud of it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I've always felt, and I suspect Elizabeth, you are gonna love this answer, you can tell me afterwards if you love the answer. Okay. I think speaking is a shortcut to success. And Absolutely. here's why, because it gives you visibility. And mm -hmm. in the process of preparing for whatever you're gonna talk about, well, you're gonna know 20 times more than if, if you didn't have a speech to give on it. And it's in the end, I mean, I was terrified of public speaking. For me, public speaking was the equivalent of fear of death or fear of snakes or fear of mm -hmm. spiders. I mean, I had a genuine phobia. And I guess I can confess that uh, I didn't get into public speaking because I knew that it would be a shortcut to success, although it proved, it proved to be so. I got into it because I realized that I had such a huge phobia that it was disabling my life. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I'll give you an example. I belong to a church in Davis, California, tiny church, total membership 60. I knew every one of them well. I knew them socially inside and outside of church. I mean, it was, then one day I was called to give an announcement in church in which I was to stand up on my own two feet and tell everybody that the energy conservation bus tour leaves from 6th and G at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to stand up in front of people and speak. And the whole week before was ruined for me because I was spending every second that I could in front of the mirror reciting that, or if I'm driving in the car, I'm reciting it. The, the day of the church service, I don't think I heard a single word that the minister said because I was just going on, God, can I do this? Can I do this? Will the words come out? And after that, I thought, you know, I got to get over this. Uh, how do you go through life if you're scared to even speak in front of a small group of close friends? And that coincided with a cold call from the Business and Professional Women's, they were called clubs back then, mm -hmm. but the business, this woman just called me up out of the blue, I didn't know her, she didn't know me, and started pitching, taking the individual development class of Business and Professional Women, ah. and that it would involve public speaking. And I thought, you know, the universe is giving me a message, take this course, and mm -hmm. I did. And, and I discovered, and yeah, the consequences from that are just amazing. Uh, example, uh, with, by the time the 14 week course was over, I think it's much shorter now, but by the time the 14 week course was over, I had my own show on the local television uh, channel mm -hmm. as a farm broadcaster. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it, it is one, one of the things about stage fright is, most of the time, once you've done it a few times, you get over it. You learn that totally. Okay, yeah, you'll survive. It's it's the the fear and the anticipation of the first one 
that will that will really get you and also the the, think of the amount of time you spent and energy you spent worrying about that. And I don't anymore. Now I, yeah. now I look forward. Uh, well, uh, something that happened, how about, good Lord, yesterday? I was giving a speech or a talk in front of a, a, an association of family businesses. And we were all socially distancing. And there are probably 70 people from a group that's usually 250. But when I arrived there to check in, the... The lovely lady in the check-in, she was being sympathetic and, and kindly. And she said, are you nervous? It'll be okay. And, and I'm thinking, I'm not nervous. I'm looking forward to this the way I'd look forward to a date with a really attractive guy. <laughs> oh, great. That's great. And, you know, you, you do have to sort of love your listeners in order oh. to do this. You, you really want to love your listeners. Well, one of the public speaking tips that I'd share with everybody, and I, I bet you give it to other people anyway, but when you're speaking, it's almost not about you. It's about what you can give to them. And to the extent that you can focus on, I'm giving you useful information that I hope is going to make your life better. Uh, when, when that's your mindset, you almost, well, I almost forget myself. I mean, I'm sort of aware, but, but my, my real focus is, hey, guys, I love you and I want to help you. My, I always say that's rule number one is make it about them. Make uh -huh. it about them. Yep. Rule, rule one is there it is. Yeah. Uh, Actually, can I, can I jump in and, and make a comment about Eleanor Roosevelt? And this has to do with uh, people who are shy. Mm -hmm. And this is something else that kind of guides my life. And I feel to, has taken me a long way and I eagerly share it with everybody else. She said, you can go through life as, a host or a guest. The guest waits for somebody to do something for them, wants somebody to look out for them. That's the guest. The host is looking out for the other people. You know, have you met, say it's, say it's a party, have you met people? Are you standing there alone and nobody's talking to you? The host goes up and makes them feel better. And I think it's just, I think speaking is the same thing as like guests and hosts, as, as a host. You're there and it's about them. It's not about you. I love that. I love that. That's a very quotable quote. Uh, or I guess I'm writing that one down. Well, when I, when I first read it, I thought, how about key to the universe? <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. So, Mitzi, you have, um, in addition to running the farms and, and all of this, uh, did you actually run Purdue Chicken Company? Oh, no. I'd love to say that I did. Uh, there are 22,000 people who work there. No, I'm a family member. And I, okay. I, do, get, I do get involved because I have the huge and incredible privilege of when there are new hires, and maybe 250 at a time, uh, I get invited to tell them about stories about Frank and you know, the history and the culture of the company. And to me, that's an honor beyond imagination. And that wouldn't have happened to me if I hadn't had public speaking training. Well, you've certainly taken a lot of risks. Can you talk a little bit about being willing to take risks? Yes. Because, you know, if you were to ask me almost the secret of, of the successes that have come my way, it's, well, it's, Overcoming fear of failure, because, you know, the number of auditions that didn't work out, the number of things that I've sent in that got rejected, innumerable. So I, I don't, at, at this point in my career, I don't really mind when, when something doesn't work out, because I'm ready to take the long shot, like, like to become a television hostess. <sighs> From somebody who's almost too scared to use the telephone 14 weeks before, who was taking a course in overcoming shyness to audition for a TV show, it's risks. Or, or I did become a syndicated columnist, but I sure got turned down lots of times before. I mean, how, you know, 23 times or something. But I do think that, that being willing to go for the long shots, oh, this payoff for that is just enormous. I mean, almost every career success I've had is crawling way out in the limb with, you know, maybe a one in 20 chance. Mm -hmm. and, and 
as long as you can get past the fear of failure, boy, there, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. But I do believe in, no, I, I do say take the risk, but prepare yourself as hard as you can for it. Well, you've said, you've talked about visualizing success. So where does that come in? Ah, actually, I, allow me to give you something really current on that subject. Mm -hmm. You've heard of Mark Victor Hansen, the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series? Right, and the co-author of your book, the, your most recent book, right? Yes, well, th this is, I, I want to share something with you about visualizing. Uh, this is the book that I wrote with, for him. Is it uh -huh. mirror reading or anything, or can you no, really read it? No, we can see it just fine. Yep, how to be how up to be in up. down times. Yeah, pull it back Our, a little bit so I can read the, the full, if it, there we go. Perfect, yes, there we go. Okay, how to be up in down times, and Mark Victor Hansen is my co-author. Oh, that man is so fabulous, you can't even believe. He deserves every bit of his success, and he is in the Guinness Book of World's Records for selling half a billion books, yes. nonfiction. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, the man's a walking miracle. Uh, we wrote this for, for people to help them get through the, the, the down times of, of, the, of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we wrote it in about three weeks. It's 100 pages long and it's 40 tips. And ask me some of the tips and I'd love to share them with you. But I, want to, but I want to give a tip right off that can help absolutely everybody and it has to do with visualizing. It's a miracle and it was brand new to me. And here it is. One day, yeah, the, the book's been out since, uh, I guess, early March. And by the way, it's priced very low because we didn't write it to make a profit. It's at $4.58, which is uh, just about the lowest that Amazon will allow mm -hmm. for a book that size. Mm -hmm. Well, one day, I got a phone call from Mark, and he says, Mitzi, you know, you've told me that you know Photoshop. And I said, yeah, I'm a black belt in it. I love it. I've been using it for 20 years. And he said, good, because I want you to do the following. I want you to write on the top of the book, which would be here. Yeah. I want you to write more than a million copies sold. So because I do Photoshop and because, you know, if Mark ah, asks for something, go. I'm probably going to do it more than a yeah. million copies sold. But I said, Mark, I don't want to do false advertising. I mean, we haven't sold a million books. And he said, that's not the point. You're not going to show that publicly, except, except in a conversation like we have, where you know that yeah. know the story behind it. He said, no, I want you to print out five copies of it. Uh, put them in your bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, office, stairwell. And here's what's going to happen. He said that, our mind is sort of wired in such a way that, you know, all sorts of things are going around us all the time. But if you have your mind thinking more than a million copies sold, all sorts of opportunities that were out there anywhere, but you just didn't notice them, they're going to occur to you. They're going, and I think I can explain it. I love it. this. I love this. Ah. And I'll, first, I'll tell you what, what, what happened to me as a result, but let me explain the principle a little further. And these are my words, not his. But have you, have you ever been pregnant? No. Well, let's see what would be parallel. Um, well, pregnant with an idea? Pregnant no, with no actually, I'm, I meant carrying a baby. Okay, yeah. But, but, but maybe you had a relative who was pregnant and you yes. really cared about that. Okay, all of a sudden, the world's absolutely full of pregnant ladies. Yes. And then uh, to take the example of my sister-in-law, she told me after, when she was full, when the world was suddenly full of pregnant ladies, although she'd never noticed them before. After she gave birth, they disappeared. Mm -hmm. But two, two years later, uh, she, she was pregnant again, but she was sort of leading my little nephew around by the hand. And she said, the world is suddenly full of pregnant ladies with two-year-olds. <laughs> but the pregnant ladies themselves, unless they had a two-year-old, she didn't notice them. <laughs> I love this. Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's sort of, you know, if your mind is sort of tuned to notice something, it's there. And, and things that have happened to me. Now, I, I, I don't want to be superstitious. And I, I, I view myself as a feet on the ground kind of person. But shortly after I wrote, you know, this, this thing to put up in my, in my office and other places around my apartment, uh, 
I got this email from somebody I've never heard of in Taiwan asking, telling me that she had already bought 200 copies for her friends, but she was wondering if Amazon would give her a discount if she bought a thousand copies because she wanted to put it in a chain of stores that she has something to do with. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Now, is that just total coincidence or did, was there something that we don't understand that, that makes that kind of thing happen? Oh, wow, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. I know that I've ordered my copy and I wanted a heart, uh, a, a physical copy, so it's on the way. Oh, and, thrilled. Thank you. Uh, and I'm just... Oh, so you're getting me one book closer to the million I'm copies. I'm getting you one Yay. book closer to the million copies, yes. I mean, you haven't hit it yet? Yeah. Uh, actually, I haven't checked. Maybe we have. <laughs> okay. Well, Mitzi, Mitzi Perdue, this has been just so exciting and wonderful and amazing to have you, oh, thank you. on the show. Do you have any particular words of wisdom of what people can do first to realize a goal, to step forward, to, to embrace the possibilities of their lives? Where would you start? There's a Buddhist saying, attitude is everything. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm smarter than, than everybody else. And I don't, but, and yet I had all these good things happen in my career. And I, I try to think, you know, what, what helped me and what I come down to is your self-talk. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, sometimes people ask me, oh, what's the worst thing that happened to you or what bad thing happened did you learn from and so forth? I almost can't do it. I flunk at that because I've almost, you know, over the years wired myself to avoid doing what I call wallowing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to think about the bad things. I'm not going to think about why it won't work. I'm not going to think about the negative things that people told me. Nope. That, do, you, do you remember that TV yeah. show? The, the, let's see, the, um, the final word of it was you off my island. Okay. For, oh, for, yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. So, so for my self-talk, uh, I'm unwilling. I want to be realistic, but I'm unwilling to be negative. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm the steamroller. I'm the one who, okay, there's this little obstacle. It's a mosquito and I'm going to steamroller over it. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, of course, that's not literally true, but it is the feeling of, I just swore I'm powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I can do this. Or another one that I say, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, and that's frequently referring to men. If they can do it, I yeah. can do it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just, Back to the Buddhist saying, attitude is everything. My attitude is, my God, I can. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're trying to tell me I can't, I'm not going to listen to you. Sorry. Uh -huh. And if you're really attacking my self-confidence, uh, I don't want to be in the same room with you. Mm. Oh. On the other hand, I very much want to be with people who encourage each other, like what you do. I mean, you're... You're the example of what I think people should do, which is help people be all they can be. Yeah, it's really, and, and as a trainer, of course, the best part of one's job is when you see somebody who goes off and says, oh no, I can do it now, I've got it now, you know. Yay, you the yay. Yeah, I can do that. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's, it's now easy, something that used to be hard. And that's yeah, although, by the way, I, I do feel when, when I'm saying to myself, I can, uh, I, I want to back it up with all the, all the training, all the courses, all the books, all the mm -hmm. YouTube videos that I can. I mean, I'm not just going to, I, okay, here's something that I don't believe. I've just said that attitude is everything, but you do have to back it up with reality, which is giving it your all, mm -hmm. you know, taking every course reading every book, making every contact, going to every conference. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I'm a combination of dream it and then back it up. I like to think of it as honing your craft so where you are free to be a channel for art. Wow. It's the art of speaking or the art of music or, uh, you know, you can be out there and 
let your message channel through you. But because uh, we're all, we've all been inspired by something larger than ourselves. So let yourself be inspired, be a channel for that inspiration. And, but use your craft to hone it into a form that your listeners can take in. Well, I have a personal motto, which is success is not measured by what you can get, but by what you can give. And I'm always taking courses. I mean, no matter what, one a year, but frequently three or four or five a year. And I do it because the more I hone my craft, the more influence I can have. And, you know, I kind of think that I'm here to serve. Yeah. And I can serve at a higher and better and more powerful level if I've learned communication skills. Well, that is a great phrase to end on. So, Mitzi Purdue, thank you. It's just been such an honor to have you on the show. I'm so glad to have met you and be happy to follow you and cheer for you. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. We're going to put links to the book, and she's written 22 of them. So uh, you definitely want to check her out. All of this is going to be in the show notes. And before I go, I want to remind you that if you're interested in how you can use your presentation skills, your public speaking, whether it's within a company or in front of a crowd, if you want to use your presentation skills, to move your listeners to take action and you want to see how you're doing, then take our free quiz. Just takes four minutes at speakforresultsquiz.com. This has been Elizabeth Bachman and I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.